Uh, everyone is a little bit familiar with SAP or Salesforce. It takes a lot of implementation and customization for it to work. The, the TCS and the Deloitte's of the world have had a very successful technology consulting practice, right? Uh, implementing these systems. And I think AI will be quite similar, not exactly the same, but, you know, because again, um, there's a lot of configuration, a lot of customization. Right? And quite a bit of, of, of tuning for performance, especially in non-deterministic systems. A lot, a lot of monitoring, right? a lot of putting in the right guardrails. Right? You can imagine that the implementation cost of AI-based systems or machine learning you know, informed applications right? are, um, are, are going to be you know, quite high. And therefore, implementation partners or implement or systems integrators are, are going to, I think, um, be quite, quite successful. Today's episode is brought to you by the Partner Insight Newsletter, your weekly data-driven source on partner-led growth. What's the secret behind most successful partnerships and go-to-market strategies? Data and insights. And that's exactly what Partner Insight brings to your inbox every week. We give you the numbers, the trends, and the strategic insights straight from the partnership playbooks of top-performing tech companies. Join the community of thousands of partnership and go-to-market leaders who stay ahead of the curve with our newsletter. It's the knowledge and inspiration you need to help you build strong partnerships, grow in cloud marketplaces, and create a successful tech ecosystem. Today, I'm really excited to have in our channel, Jan Zhan, COO of famous AI startup, PolyAI. In customer operations alone, AI will lift productivity 38%, according to McKinsey. It's uh, almost half a trillion dollar opportunity. PolyAI technology is used in industries like hospitality companies like Marriott, Automotive, and the company was founded in the same lab in Cambridge, which pioneered speech recognition. Today, we have a really fascinating discussion on AI adoption cycle, what are the build by partner decisions that companies are making? Who are the third parties that's involved in this decision making? How companies work with partners, helping them to implement AI technology and many other things, including cloud marketplaces. And uh, without further ado, Yang Zhang. Hi, Yang. Great to have you today. Great to see you, Roman. Congrats on PolyAI recent inclusion in Forbes AI 15 list. PolyAI unique advantage is having a conversational AI and having unique understanding of customers. Can you tell us a little bit more about your products and who is it for and who is it used by? We make enterprise voice assistants, right? And we call them customer-led voice assistants. So um, I think most people are quite familiar with the product as consumers. If, if you've called into customer service uh, sometime in the last 20 years, you've probably had the experience of being greeted with something like, uh, tell me in a few words while you're calling, right? One of these um, automated uh, voice systems. And I think most people's reactions to those systems are, are, are quite negative um, or quite disappointing um, in, in the sense that um, it's, uh, um, you know, we, we've done a lot of research on why people call into customer service as opposed to using another channel like chat or or email. And I, and I do think that there's a there's a consumer psychology that then when they want to call, they really want to talk about their problem. Right. The customer wants to talk about their problem in their own terms, um, using their own words and then and also in their own time frame. Right. They, they want to get a real time response. They want to speak to a human or at least to have a human like conversational experience. So when voice automation, <clears throat> you know, the, the older generation of technology limited people to, um, you know, saying like, tell me in a few words what you're calling about, you're really deflating the customer expectation to be able to have a, a, a free flowing conversation with someone. That's why, um, you know, we're, we're very sympathetic to, to people um, at, at that point pressing zero or asking to speak to a human, right? And, and we've all had experiences like that. So what, what AI has done and what poly AI has done um, in the last five years is to, to elevate that, that experience, right, into a fully conversational one where, um, one, the customer is fully enabled to speak what they want to say uh, in the way that they would speak to another person. So uh, we are not asking people, tell me in a few words what you're calling about. We, help, we open every call with how can I help, right? So you're bidding for the customer to, to say whatever it is that they want to say. Um, and you want to be able to understand people turn after turn and also to be able to offer something back. 
right? So as as to be able to continue a conversation, to finish transactions, to 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 bring that um, interaction to the finish line, so that you're creating value for the customer and you're capturing data in the meantime, right? And so that that's it's a it's a problem that is really simple, that it is really relatable for everyone who has really spoken to an automated customer service. Uh, machine, but um, it's something that um, that is 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 quite challenging to do uh, technically, right? Because of 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 the variety of of ways in which we speak, um, and that's something that that Poly AI does. Great solution, and, and actually pretty substantial problem. And uh, I'm as a non-native speaker can, can relate to that. Like when people don't understand you, when when AI do, doesn't understand you, it's it's very annoying. Can you can you share a little bit like a few examples maybe? Voice conversations still constitute about over 70% of all customer service interactions, right? So the, the use cases are very broad. Um, if you're calling FedEx anywhere outside of the United States, um, you're probably talking to one of our bots. Uh, if you are um, asking for a towel to be brought up to your room at a Marriott hotel in many, many places in the world, you're, you're talking to one of our bots. If you're a Volkswagen owner and you're calling in um, to the Audi service line here in the UK, you're probably speaking to one of our bots. If you're making uh, a booking at a Green King pub here in the UK, you're probably speaking to one of our bots. So the the the, the applications are broad and, and above and beyond that, we have customers in, in financial services, insurance, uh, retail uh, and healthcare as well. We live in the era of explosion of AI, right? Uh, uh, McKinsey suggested that it's going to be seventeen trillion dollars, sort of transformation of the industry, and, and and so on. And yet, I think a lot of companies really struggle to understand like how to apply AI to their business. So you mentioned a couple of great examples. Your product also seems to be customized to to, to to customer data, right? Like when you're talking about Marriott or, or Volkswagen. Can you speak a little bit more about how you like your product and your model sort of compares with foundational models that we hear so much today? Just to be a little bit technical, right? So uh, AI really got uh, the last wave of excitement over AI before this current one, which began at the end of 2022, uh, was really when um, the, the, the transformer architecture was delivered and popularized in 2017, right? And that, that's where Poly AI got its start, where we're a spin out of the University of Cambridge. And, and I, we, we, we built some of the first um, conversational applications over trans, uh, trans, transformer architectures back, back in the day. And, and even though generative, um, generative um, AI or, or uh, an AI system that would generate text um, um, either um, um, as a response to a prompt or as a response to kind of uh, a, another line in a dialogue, right, or, or a dialogue prompt, um, uh, has been around for a long time um, since uh, in, in the enterprise use case um, out of choosing the best reply out of a list of replies um, is still it's the preferred approach to 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 voice automation uh, and, and you can very easily imagine why right in the sense that um, you you, you want to make sure as an enterprise when you're talking to your customer that every single line of dialogue is uh, on brand, vetted, and uh, the right thing to say, and and, and when when that uh, when that conversation um, goes awry or outside of the domain of of, of what people can what, what the system knows that it's transferred to to a human, right? So that the customer has a, a experience that is helpful um, and um, and and branded and and also safe. Um, so this 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 uh, generative model, right? The, using generative model. Um, has never really um, been considered seriously, right, for using enterprise customer service use cases until about last 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 year, when when all of this hype around ChatGPT has has exploded. Um, not because generative models weren't there, but because it it, it is kind of um, it's it's just using the, the uh, an inappropriate tool for 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 the problems to speak. And to this day, even though generative models now are now a, a lot more uh, clever than they were a year ago or two years ago. Um, in the enterprise customer facing use case, right? Um, it's still a problem uh, that I don't think a lot of enterprises are going to get get over in a sense that it's handing off control to a system that is essentially non deterministic, right? And, uh, and, and, and I think a lot of um, 
uh, there there needs to be a lot more guardrails that's put around that system for people for our customers to become um, comfortable. Um, that said, I think that there is a there there are very good product approaches that we've taken and a lot of other companies have taken to blend this kind of retrieval based AI and generative AI into a seamless customer experience. Right. So in a hotel use case, for example. Um, if uh, if someone's asking, calling uh, the front desk to ask, uh, you know, when, when is the pool open, right? What are the opening hours of the pool? There, there's no reason for you to apply a generative model to to that, right? In, in the sense that that that's that's a uh, a prescripted answer uh, that can be retrieved by an NLU model, for example. Then uh, a question like, uh, does the second bathroom in the junior suite? Um, in the north building have uh, a shower or a bath, right? Um, and that's the type of question that um, is, is, is probably not anticipated by the, the, the people who designed the system or, or hasn't been anticipated by the people who... And, and if the generative system were to look at kind of the spec sheet of the rooms, right? And this is again, retrieval based LLM, right? Uh, retrieval augmented LLM uh, uh, applications. Um, it, 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 it could probably answer that question quite, 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 quite well. And so you're really looking at um, generative AI from a customer experience point of view, patching up that, you know, if, if, you're, if your NLU based retrieval model is performing, at, uh, you know, 60, 70% uh, containment or 60, 70% uh, resolution rate, uh, maybe a generative model can, can help you um, um, uh, bring up the, the, the long tail and get that number to 80 or 90%. Just in simple language, if I understand correctly, you're saying that uh, if you asking about the bathroom, you don't want AI model to hallucinate something which is not uh, factual, right? Uh, but, but at the same time, you want a generative AI potentially to help you to make the conversation sort of a little bit smoother and uh, more natural. It's not about hallucination because when, when people talk about uh, hallucinations and generative AI models, that, that is tapping into, you're basically asking it point blank a question, right? That is, uh, is, is, is about the outside world or something about the outside world. Like, you know, um, uh, how many uh, U.S. presidents um, has there been since like 1931 or something like that? And there is a correct answer, but the generative model may just give you an answer that is incorrect and you wouldn't know, right? So that's 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 the hallucination, right? And and I don't think that that many enterprises would really even consider using that particular application of generative models for their customer service customers, right? What I'm talking about is retrieval based or what they call retrieval augmented like LLMs, which is to ask a generative model, look at this spec sheet, right? Look at this knowledge base and only look at this knowledge base and generate an answer based on that knowledge base, right? So, um, so hallucination doesn't really come into play in that particular use case, right? It, it is, it, but it is generating an answer that otherwise would not have been prescripted because the, the, the question is so niche. Thanks so much for, 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 for explaining it. Maybe just to wrap up, uh, you know, uh, kind of understanding of, of, of like what poly AI does and we will, we'll talk a little bit more about partnerships later on. Um, so you as a company, you provide to enterprises like Volkswagen, uh, sort of solution in the box, right? We, which, which includes technology, which includes services. Like how, how do you work with, 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 with uh, your clients? We generally work on a build and release model, right? And, and I think that um, what, what building, so um, there, there's usually in, in, in AI or machine learning informed um, applications, um, there is often a uh, quality versus control type of conundrum where, um, you know, if you, if you build um, if you build something that is very very high quality for the end customer experience, there's probably a lot of uh, of of hand uh, tooling that goes in and a lot of fine tuning, right? So um, a, a lot of companies um, who deliver on this model can deliver quite good um, customer experiences, but then. The, the system is a little bit of a black box, right? And I think a lot of uh, enterprise IT teams a little bristle at that at that particular um, you know um, 
delivery model because it's very difficult for them to um, configure, right? And very difficult for them to kind of keep um, keep that system working with all of the other uh, pieces of technology they have in their tech stack. Um, and on the other end, you have, um, you know, uh, like approaches that are basically tool sets, right? When the cloud giants, for, for example, uh, when Google sells you um, automation or, or or customer service automation or conversational automation. They're selling you dialogue flow, um, which is a tool set. And so it's, you know, for for enterprises that are really looking for a solution, um, <clears throat> you you know, if you buy from Google or Amazon, um, they're really like dumping a box of Legos on, on the table and say, you know, and they're asking you to put, put something together based on what your needs are, right? And, and I think so that is the quality control conundrum in the sense that you 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 if you want more quality you're giving up control and if you want more control you're giving up quality um and so the way that we deliver is somewhere in the middle uh, a little bit uh, probably bias and bias in 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 favor of quality and so when we say build and release we will build a a customer um, um service automation um application um, to about let's say eighty percent uh, doneness, um, and so uh, we deliver this in the form of templates. And so a template is a uh, customer uh, conversational flow that has a, a both a, an industry um, a use case. Uh, well, basically, it's industry specific and has a use case, right? So again, for example, um, um, a change of address in the banking industry is is a template that we would deliver, right? And then we would expect either uh, a customer uh, themselves or us co-creating with the customer or a third party partner to deliver that the rest of that 20%, right? To make that a completed product. We have found that that approach um, is, um, is, is, is the, the best um, uh, uh, median uh, between, uh, between quality and control. Thanks so much. And uh, the reason why I, uh, you know, ask you so many questions about details is because I think uh, uh, it's it is important to understand what, for our next discussion about like how companies sort of partner and how companies work uh, around AI technology, right? So if I'm a company today, I have this pressure that I need to do something about AI, and I basically have like three decisions, which is typical decisions that companies have they either build sort of buy or partner right when they come to building they face in, in case of ai tens sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars potentially of training models and nobody trains models uh, except of like a few organizations maybe we'll talk a little bit more about open source later on but but like sticking to build buy and partner if you buy solution like you mentioned uh, you will need to have a lot of expertise in house to actually customize uh, the, 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 the model, fine tune it, to make sure that everything is uh, uh, sort of aligned. You'll have more control, but, but you have need, you, you'll need to have a talent to do that, which very few companies actually have today, right? So we will come to partnering. And uh, partnerships around um, application of AI models and AI technologies are very interesting things. Let's. Let, let me ask you, like, what are the things, uh, sort of what are the common partnership models that you see in the field today? Maybe, you know, on, on examples of, of your organization and just like, like we caveat about when we talk here about partnerships, we are not talking about like fake partnerships when like a vendor sort of partners with this customer, we're talking about like including third party into, into the mix. So what is a, what is a common partnership models that you see in, in the field today? Great question, but I, I want to I want to disambiguate like two two different uh, concepts. When you're saying that a company is pursuing commercially has a commercial plan to pursue AI, right? So uh, you can talk about that at the foundational model layer, or you can talk about that in the application layer, right? So um, and you're right uh, on the foundational model layer, um, it is um, probably ill advised for a non tech company. Um, to uh, embark on training their own models. Though I, I will say that things, I mean, there are companies like Bloomberg, which, you know, ostensibly is a, is a tech company, right? A tech media company that has trained their 
uh, their their own um, LLM uh, for uh, an industry specific use case. I can see foresee healthcare companies doing it, but um, I think for the for the majority of enterprises out there, having their own large language model uh, doesn't quite make make sense. And I think that again, there's there's a differentiation or the d distinction has to be made between um, you know, uh, training your own model on, on, on your own data versus using third party, uh, large language models to access your data to create, um, you know, AI generated services and responses. Right. So, uh, so, um, then there is the application layer, right? Then, um, we are on the application layer, even though we have a lot of our foundational technologies and we use our own proprietary models, uh, uh, increasingly, the value that we see um, is to be able to put um, not just our models, but other models along with our models and all of our orchestration layers to create um, an, an application. Um, and, and, and in this case, um, you do have companies that um, want to do a do-it-yourself approach, and those companies are usually um, customers of 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 the large cloud giants who have toolkits in conversational AI um, that they uh, that's their go to market model right it is to have their enterprise customers to uh, buy more uh, GCP or AWS or Azure <clears throat> and make sure that you're use and then making sure that their customers are are using um, uh, you know, Dialogflow or Lex or a Microsoft bot framework to create their conversational tools. And the problem there is that um, the, the toolkit can be very good, but if the if if the if if um, if the people who are building it, it's usually third party services, third party shops that are building this, right? Uh, off of off of these technology platforms, uh, the the results are usually not very very good, right? So the build it yourself approach. Um, uh, certainly in a challenging medium like voice, right? Maybe if you're building an HR bot for allowed to, to kind of get people to apply for holiday or, or creating kind of internal tech support, um, that's, that's perfectly fine. But um, to be able to communicate with your customers in the voice channel is, is, is a very difficult ask. And so the, the build it yourself approach quite difficult and reserved for the largest of enterprises where, um, and, and in certain sectors like financial services, you see a lot more um, of uptake there in the build it yourself. Um, in terms of, um, in terms of buying, um, we see a lot of customers that want to buy from us, um, you know, customers that are probably underserved by their own IT teams, like even large enterprises that don't spend a whole lot on IT as a proportion of their revenues. And so, you, you know, we are, um, you know, cutting edge, right? We use, um, uh, we, or a lot of our uh, models are, are, are proprietary, are, you know, it's, it's, it's state of the art, so to speak, but we package it in an application that people can buy. And it, it tends to, the people who tend to buy are, um, our customer, uh, our, 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 our enterprise customers, so they're still large companies that tend to not um, um, spend a, a huge percentage of their revenues on IT, right? And so they don't have that, that um, uh, amount of, um, um, of budget. And so they're just basically in the market for, for a solution. Um, I think, I would say that partnerships are a subset of those customers. It's very difficult to wean off um, um, customers that have a build it yourself type of approach at this cycle, at, at this part of the adoption cycle, right? A lot of people are looking, a lot of IT professionals are looking at AI as maybe a, a, a core capability that they want to own, right? So it's, um, but, but, but putting those folks aside, um, you have the people then who buy, or then that you have the people who 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 would buy from from a partner. So um, I I think that you know for us what's the the partnerships that have been successful are um, either implementation partners who usually sit either um, above or below um, ourselves in the tech stack. And what I mean by above is is that you know it, because we do. Um, voice automation, it's the people who handle the the, the telephony stack, right? So, um, you know, either CCAS vendors or, uh, so contact center as a service, right? Vendors uh, or um, 
or uh, PBX cloud PBX vendors, um, um, and then or downstream partners, so systems of record, so like a Salesforce or a uh, um, like a vertical specific, uh, um, you know, CRM. When I look at the space, right, and I sort of see BCG reports saying that sort of ninety five percent of companies. Uh, are trying to figure out like how to go about uh, AI and when they they kind of include partner and collaborate with this partner sort of meaningfully, the result is 33x better in terms of ROI. I guess like BCG possibly includes in this set both vendors and third party partners. Uh, but if I'm a company, how do I even think through this uh, AI sort of space, right? Do I go to a consulting partner like McKinsey or BCG? Do I go to the cloud provider? What does a typical uh, decision tree look like? At this particular time, right? So this is, we're in the middle, of maybe at the peak of a hype cycle um, for generative AI and large language models. A lot of the mandate is really coming at a board level. I feel like for, for for their IT teams or for their management teams to explore this technology, right? And so um, I think there are a few ways to frame that mandate, some probably more helpful than others, right? So a lot of people are thinking, how can I use generative AI to create an advantage for my business? Um, and I think that's one way to think about it. I think the probably the most productive ways, to, uh, you know, question to ask is that what are the enduring operational challenges that I have in my business that could be solved or improved with generative AI or AI technology, right? And, and I think that um, the, you know, it, it's it's always a little bit of a fallacy to choose to settle on a tool before you know what the problem is, right? And so I think for a lot of management teams, it, it really is to figure out, um, okay, these are the problems. Well, I think this, it, it probably, you know, there needs to be a good enough uh, understanding, and this you don't have to be terribly technical, but a good enough understanding of the strengths and weaknesses of what generative AI can do, right? And, and I think that's just doing your homework. And then thinking about um, a list of problems that you have within your enterprise that are high value, right? Maybe high value, um, low stakes of failure, you know, um, things like customer service, actually, like maybe even internal comms, right? Internal um, comm systems like, uh, you know, I think conversational AI really began in HR and internal like tech support ticketing right before it went, you know, into into customer customer facing applications, right? There's something like that that's a little bit lower stakes for people to experiment, right? And to say, like, maybe I can either through a partner or buying a technology, make a difference, right? Use a generative application to make a difference. Yeah, makes sense. But but, but doubling down on, on, on your point about board members, probably consulting companies getting a lot of business, right? Because board members like to, to, to engage strategy consulting because they, 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 they probably, you know, prefer to, to get some high level understanding first uh, I would probably also argue that uh, if you're a company which is not technology focused uh, today and you probably hear about uh, AI every day and you start to think about maybe like a dozen of different areas. I heard about one CEO sort of asking um, that his team about what are the use cases that we can apply to Gen AI model to. And, and he got maybe like a 50 use cases. <laughs> so it's really difficult to, to even like figure out what, what are the use cases. So partners can help potentially, they potentially can, can, can introduce more difficulty in, in decision-making, but, but, but potentially sort of they, 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 they can help. You, uh, as, a, as a company, you, you mentioned you partner with CRM providers uh, in sort of upstream and downstream for, for your technology, which, which sort of makes a lot of sense. If it's possible, could you share like a use case when when you partner with a, with a company and you implement this technology kind of more successfully? A lot, but not all of our work in the hotel space is um, is 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 delivered through implementation partners, right? And I and and uh, and more specifically, um, uh, P, uh, cloud PBX vendors. So um, every hotel has a phone system. And um, and that phone system used to be on-prem, um, and it, it, the industry is still in the process of kind of upgrading that into uh, cloud-enabled or cloud-centric uh, PVX systems, right? So this is 
you're calling into a hotel when you're in or when you're into a hotel, you're using your in-room phone to call uh, the front desk or the concierge, right? So um, again, um, you know, de delivering our system um, into tens of thousands of hotels is a tall ask for a technology company because there's just so much configuration that needs to be done for each site and um, not to mention the actual integration to the phone systems on, on, on at the hotel right and so it, it's a it's a it's very logical for us to to choose cloud pbx vendors the 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 companies that actually provide these services to 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 the hotels as as a natural kind of delivery partner there and so again um referring back to that build and release model that i um that 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 i described um uh, we would build a hotel front desk template to about 80 percent completion right which is to say that we have figured out um Mo the, the the eighty or a hundred things that constitute you know let's say seventy five percent of what people could talk about in a in, in in a hotel setting right so this is asking for a towel if you have a pool what the opening hours are is there a happy hour uh, what what uh, where's the nearest um, uh, how far is the the hotel from the airport do you have a shuttle service can you leave luggage so on and so forth right these these. Uh, and so then you would deliver that template to your partner and they would do the last uh, 20%, which is to customize it for a particular hotel and to actually turn turn on that bot, to launch that bot, and to test that bot in hypercare to make sure that it's doing everything that it's doing, right? And also then to, um, you know, uh, have that client or own that client relationship and do uh, quarterly business reviews and 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 uh, with the with the client. Yeah, yeah. Quarterly business reviews are um, uh, an important element, both in partnerships and in in in, in clients relationship as well. Thanks so much for sharing great examples. One more thing that might be of interest is that you know machine learning based products, um, i.e., not entire that 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 where the performance is non deterministic. Um, Per perhaps requires more hyper care, right? And more uh, partner involvement in its delivery, precisely because there is greater variance in the performance of these systems, right? And you do have to track it a little bit closer. Um, and so um, uh, then let's say traditional SaaS, right? And and to 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 be a little bit more communicative with the with with the end customer, uh, especially at the beginning of a of, a, of an implementation. That's uh, almost like entire reason of our conversation today, because I'm, I'm trying to understand better for, for myself and for our audience, will explosion of AI will lead to more um, collaboration and kind of inclusion of different partners because it feels to me at least at this point when ai technology is not sort of 100 percent reliable right so you cannot like say hey just go do this and uh close your eyes so you need to you need to track it like like you mentioned you probably need to 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 have more uh, oversight and partners could be like a, a good like a proxy for for that. Another thing that I wanted to ask you is about competition, right? Again, like explosion of different technologies and now companies are using multiple models themselves and they, they sort of work with multiple partners. Uh, this almost forced people to be comfortable with competition. And Microsoft is a great example. They they they, they build their own tech. They partner with OpenAI. They, they they partner. They integrate with different other companies. So you as a Poly AI, you partner with Twilio, then Desk. You partner with uh, Ultimate AI, which uh, is not your competitor but uh, could be. How do you think about competition uh, in this age of AI? To be honest, it's the first time that I've heard the, the word coopetition. But I, I I get I get your drift, right? So I think that um. An example of a very successful partnership is that we, 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 ha we have a very successful relationship with AWS. Obviously, Amazon has its own uh, entry in the enterprise or voice assistant or um, conversational AI space, Lex, right? Um, and, uh, but I think that AWS also has multiple um, product uh, lines. So um, something like, uh, you know, AWS Connect is um, is the the CCAS entry 
uh, there, and sometimes and oftentimes they uh, run into um, situations um, where poly AI would be a more appropriate um, kind of partner rather than their own in-house solution, right? And there is the notion that you want to be able to um, provide and 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 a simple like uh, use case is that um, we we have much better um, capabilities in certain languages, right? Than than in-house solution and, and and Amazon, and it makes sense for us to be um, to be the the voice automation solution in a you know in a tech stack that that requires Dutch, for example, right? So um, now I think that 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 comes from a philosophy, right? A very customer centric philosophy that really you you want to be um, you want to build the best solution for your customer, right? That 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 you want to have a tech stack that is best in class, right? Uh, and I think that's um, I I think that that like enterprise customers are kind of you know um, coming around to this using the best in class type of uh, you know methodology, right? Um, and and um, and it's it's not something that maybe you you saw a lot in the in the in the earlier part of the cloud adoption, but uh, you know it is now definitely um, a philosophy that a lot of customers take. And so partnerships, um, even in with with um, with people who um, or, or with with partners who might be competitive with you in other parts of the business, is still very much uh, 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 a a. Uh, possibility right that doesn't have it doesn't mean that it happens everywhere i think there are um you know it depends on how close your capabilities are and where you choose to cooperate and where you choose to compete right and if if you're competing in most places it probably doesn't make sense for you to be partners but if you have a distinct strength that is a a complement to um to to um to your partner's offerings elsewhere that, that you can have that conversation. I, I don't think that you can necessarily draw a, a um, you know, um, uh, an, an overarching um, kind of um, rule about, you know, where you partner, where you compete. I think it's a very much of a case to case, case by case basis. That makes sense. <clears throat> Thanks so much for sharing. And uh, I agree with you that, uh, I mean, first of all, competition is a, is a term like widely adopted in partnership circles, but, but not necessarily outside of, of it. So um, talking about partnership with AWS, um, you, you you sort of recently listed in AWS Marketplace, so companies can buy your product uh, through AWS Marketplace. Uh, can you can you talk a little bit more about uh, what was behind your decision to, to list on Marketplace? Again, it's, it's kind of common practice today, right, for companies to list on cloud marketplaces. Um, so, but, but still would be interesting to, to hear your sort of insights from, 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 from kind of partnering closer with AWS. I'm sure as you've discussed, you've discussed with your other guests, I mean, AWS is a, is a very, uh, partner friendly ecosystem, right? I think per, per, perhaps, um, the most out of, uh, out of the cloud giants, um, and, and I, and I think there was a strong, um, interest on their side. I think they pursued us. Um, as 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 a company that could add value uh, to them, and I and I think where um, and obviously it, it it is it wasn't the um, I, I think everyone that 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 we've spoken to AWS has been incredibly helpful, uh, but naturally as because we are competitive in certain respects, it, you know it is a, a little bit of a. I wouldn't even say a difficult conversation. It's just that you know it took it took several conversations to figure out where we draw the boundaries and where um, you know where um, um, the most productive kind of joint pursuits would be. Um, but um, and then I think you know uh, it just it took some time for us to um, get all of the stickers, so to speak, and, and to be um, and and. And 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 to 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 be listed on marketplace to be an APN. Congrats! Yeah, I, I think you you're correct that uh, AWS is very partner friendly and it's definitely the, the right step uh, to, to 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 get listed because a lot of buyers, you know, uh, purchase through AWS marketplace and the trend is going up. Uh, so maybe like a couple of like last questions. One of them I wanted to touch uh, about uh, sort of difficulties or challenges, I should also say, 
uh, that companies are facing when when they they implement a technology. Uh, BCG did like a really detailed research, and they found that typically they struggle with sort of three things: compatibility. I mean, multiple things, but like top of mind is compatibility with legacy systems, right? And some access to internal data and um, figuring out clear rationale behind ROI of, 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 of applying AI technologies. I think it might be, the, the last one might be easy for you because uh, I've seen another research saying that almost half of companies who apply AI voice assistance, they, they, they see cost reduction and another half has like higher revenue. So it's probably clear, but, but let, tell me a little bit more about what are the sort of challenges that uh, companies are typically facing when applying AI and how do you overcome them? The first challenge that a lot of companies face is to, do I do it myself or do I buy the solution? Right. And I think that, um, um, you see this a lot in, in 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 places like financial services where people are very very keen on like oftentimes on, on building their own solution because they believe that the, well um, I I think this is FS tends to be the the, the sector of, of 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 the enterprise market where um, there's probably the most investment in IT right and so there is a um, there's both higher capabilities and there's probably also an entrenched interest to own as much of that technology and that capability. Um, and I think that we're at a part of the adoption cycle where um, whether that is a good idea in the long run is still to be seen, right? I think history will probably say that like, you know, um, it's probably not a good idea in the sense that in in uh, the the companies AI company conversational AI companies will will specialize and provide such a better level of service in a in the form of a of, of a near finished product to to enterprise customers rather than a do it yourself. But that, that's we're still at that part of of the adoption cycle, right? Where there's a lot of do I do it myself or do I buy? Um, I think that on the 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 the. P of the people who 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 choose to to do anything, either to build it themselves or, or to buy, um, I think again um, the 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 people and the processes that you devote to um, implementing or building SaaS or any kind of a deterministic system versus implementing a machine learning informed application which is a non-deterministic system are very very different right so um there are there this is actually a really probably interesting um you know um uh, you know some i think something you know someone from mckinsey or 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 bcg should should pick this up as a as like an overall or maybe a, a business school academic should pick this up as a as a as a topic of research but the, the approaches, the expectations, right, um, and the uh, just in, the internal project management, you know, uh, is, is all very different, right? In the sense of, of, of uh, implementing a system that is supposed to do one very specific thing. And if you configure everything well, it will do that one specific thing versus a machine learning system where it it, it, it performs and behaves probabilistically, right? The, the, the length of hypercare, the, the degree of customization, uh, even how frequently you have to, uh, to, to, um, to, uh, you know, to, to engage with the customer, whether, you know, uh, your, whether you have QBRs versus MBRs, right? Is, 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 is different between, um, you know, deterministic systems and non-deterministic systems. And I think that that's actually a huge, um, 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 blind spot for, 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 for companies trying to adopt AI. That's a really great point. So I feel like building AI is probably like raising a child, right? So kind of like, so you, you cannot really control it to the extent like you can control, I don't know, like a, like a, like a machine and previous generation of SaaS is basically like a just pure machine and the AI is a little bit more like a human. To your point about AI being kind of more difficult to, to build internally, do you feel like partners can help and partners can sort of implement, partners can help the things through, kind of figure out the strategy, find like the right solutions or or it's more sort of on the company sort of shoulders to, to, to figure out themselves. 
if you think about partnerships between, you know, if you think about the different parties, right? So you have the enterprise customer, you have the technology company, and, um, you know, I would say that, you know, it just in a very, very generalized way, right? That when you have, when you're talking about enterprise SaaS, when you're talking about something and, and everyone can 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 come up with, uh, everyone is a little bit familiar with SAP or Salesforce or, or Epic or one of these systems, right? It takes, it takes a lot of implementation and customization for it to work, right? And therefore, um, you know the PWCs and the and the uh, the the TCS and the Deloitte's of the world um, have a very successful and have had a very successful uh, uh, technology consulting practice, right? Uh, implementing these systems, and I think AI will be quite similar, not exactly the same, but you know because again, um, there's a lot of configuration, a lot of customization. Right and quite a bit of 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 tuning for performance, especially in non-deterministic systems. A lot, a lot of monitoring, right? A lot of putting in the right guardrails, right? And so um, the the you can imagine that the implementation cost of AI-based systems or machine learning, you know, informed applications, right, are um, are are going to be you know, quite high and therefore implementation partners or implement or systems integrators are, are going to, I think, um, be quite, quite successful um, in, in the next uh, kind of adoption wave. It's, it's been a great conversation. Thank you so much for, 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 for sharing your thoughts and uh, congrats on your great clients that, that you mentioned and uh, awards you, you achieved. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's really interesting time in, in AI adoption, in, in tech in general. Uh, so let me ask you, like, what are you excited about, like, sort of looking in the next couple of years? I think by the end of this year, we will start to incorporate uh, generative technologies into our live deployments, both from a customer facing, um, you know, uh, the customer facing voice assistants, and also um, in our analytics suite as well, right? And I think one of the things that that the generative AI is arguably even better for is 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 not you know generating things that your customers will hear or see, but uh, really to summarize and to structure data in a way at a, at a fraction of the cost uh, of 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 what what currently is available, um, and so um, that that is um, just to 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 see that become the norm, right? You know, a year after these technologies have really you know. Um, like made a splash uh, uh, in 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 the customer face or the consumer facing world in the enterprise setting is 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 going to be really exciting. So yeah, um, I I really enjoyed our conversation. I personally learned a lot about uh, applying AI to large enterprises, and I think it's it's really interesting to to kind of think a little bit through like like where really partners partners have a play here and uh, what is their role and how companies. Can become successful. I look forward to to uh, following your success in Poly AI. And uh, again, thank you so much. Thank you, Roman. Pleasure as always.